Welcome to Book Passage. Thank you for coming out and supporting your independent bookstore. Um, thanks to you. We have these great opportunities to host these incredible authors and have these events. So thank all of you for coming out and supporting this and also the, the greater project of selling and creating great books. My name is Turn it up. Oh, oh, you don't like the music with the mic? <laughs> 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 Hold that thought. <laughs> Good idea, right? Oh, yeah. We get a manager to turn off the music in the store it would be fantastic. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was having a seizure. <laughs> <laughs> I think they did it. Okay. Is it off? Yeah. yeah. All right. So they turned off the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to fix this quickly. So. Very music off, I promise. My name is Melissa Cesaro, and I am a huge admirer of Mary Carr's work over many years, so I could not be more thrilled to be introducing her here at Book Passage this evening. Mary Carr is the author of three best-selling memoirs, The Liars Club, Cherry, and Lit. She has also published four collections of poetry and her award-winning essays, have appeared in publications such as The Atlantic Monthly and The New Yorker. And I don't know if any of you know this, maybe a few of you do, that Mary is also a songwriter. And she made a beautiful album with Rodney Crowell called Kin. And now she has written this fantastic new book, The Art of Memoir. It's a book that was inspired by her years of teaching at Syracuse University, and she has been teaching memoir there for many years. We need to tell our stories, and in this book, Mary Carr gives us permission, and also guides us along in an honest, spirited, and authentic voice that she is so good at. And if you or anyone you know longs to understand the nuances of memoir from a master of the form, this is the book. And if for whatever reason uh, this is a book you need and it's not in your budget at this time, Mary has generously um, brought five books up here. And um, just when you come up to get a book signed, if that's something that is, uh, would be important in your life right now, um, come on up during the signing. Thank you, Mary, for doing that. Um, so let's take a moment to acknowledge the incredible work that Mary Carr has done for memoir. I feel so and ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I feel ashamed. It's just so bad. I think that uh, we should, like, shout and holler at and welcome her to Book Passage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I mean, the last time I was here, no, no kidding, I had a, a New York Times bestseller, and I swear to God, there were like three people here, <laughs> and I slept with two of them. <laughs> I think the third was like, separate That night? Not that night. <laughs> really, I'm imagining my life is way more interesting than it is. 
Uh, no, so I'm, I'm, and my goal, as I recently said somewhere, my goal in high school was to stay out of the penitentiary, so <laughs> all of this is quite shocking to me right now. Um, I think what I'm going to do is talk for about 20 minutes and then take questions from you guys. Writing memoir, if it's done right, is knocking yourself out with your own fist. When I coach somebody through one, I always feel like that mean sergeant in Platoon, you know, the Tom Berenger character who's like bent over, the guy whose guts are all extruding, and, and, and the guy screaming, and, and then Tom Berenger is saying, take the pain. Um, and the guy says, oh, okay, and starts stuffing his guts back. So, um, only about 15% of this book addresses actual writing a memoir. I, I put directly saying, this is what, do this, do that. Um, mostly, I, I hope it makes people better readers, not just of memoir, but of novels or poems or parole board pleas or, <laughs> or whatever it is you read, but also better readers of your own memories and more curious about your own inner lives and about the stuff that's happened to you. Um, we all remember through a filter of self. And, and if, you, if you don't know the shape of that self, then, then um, or if you do know the shape of the self, I have found, I have a better chance of kind of really apprehending the world, like just knowing what's going on, rather than just beaming the world from my eyeballs, which is my tendency. Um, what recommends me to write this book is not that I've written three memoirs. It's not even that they've done well. I have been a fan of memoir since I was a little girl. Uh, if you, I, I did a Paris Review interview about the form, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago. And there's, they, they printed a, fax, a copy of my journal, my childhood journal, age 10, 1965. It says, when I grow up, I will write one half poetry and one half autobiography. <laughs> It's strange, right? <laughs> and, then, and then after that I write this really pathetic sentence. I am not very successful as a little girl. <laughs> when I grow up I will probably be a mess. <laughs> so, so this is obviously, I, I was prescient as a child, but also um, I was told all my life I was going to be a mess. Um, and I was a weird, lonely, sad little human unit. Um, and something about memoir just made me feel less lonely. And it, and it kind of infused me with hope. Because so often people are writing about being in a war, or being in the Holocaust, or, or being in some family at, at least as awful as my own. And somehow a novel, even though I, I felt like Huck Finn was someone I was going to meet someday, or I felt like Scout would be my best friend if I met her, I knew I would never meet those people, and I knew the stuff was made up. And, and so a novel just couldn't give me that sense, that, that optimism that, that I was so desperate for, uh, because I was just a little dark-minded individual. Um, I mean, if Maya Angelou who survived the Jim Crow South or, or poor blind deaf Helen Keller, you know, could escape their own private house, then maybe I could get out of my, my own difficulty, which was reading for hours a day in a state of socially sanctioned disassociation. To kind of fence myself off from the chaos in my, my less than perfect household. Well, let's face it, however the audience for memoir has, has burgeoned, and I think your being here tonight is evidence of that, your memoir readers, uh, it's still, it's kind of a trailer trash form. <laughs> <laughs> I speak as trailer trash, so I, I can say this, but it's, it's a kind of ghetto-ass primitive. <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't have this exalted history, like, the, you know, poetry, it doesn't have a form like the novel, you know, it's episodic. One thing happens and another thing happens and another thing happens. There's no danger of the American Academy wanting to induct me 
for my memoirs. <laughs> the way they do, say, Zadie Smith or, or John Franson, both friends of mine, for their, for their writing. I once heard Jeffrey Wolf, who wrote a book I love named called Duke of Deception, describe it as outsider art, you know, like those people who hang Coke bottles from their pecan trees and stuff. Was that <laughs> or, or he also likened it to inscribing the Lord's Prayer on a grain of rice. <laughs> so, you know, when I was in graduate school in the late 70s, it was the province of weirdos and, you know, film stars. Um, <laughs> Back then, fiction was still pretty realistic, and I think as fiction has gotten more dystopic or hyper-intellectual or weird, readers that are hungry to, for a window inside the American family, say, or war, say, or, you know, human experience, if people are hungry for the real, I think have migrated to memoir, because fiction's just not, not delivering it. DeLillo, once said, fiction starts with meaning, and then the writer manufactures events to kind of prove or justify that meaning. For, but a memoirist starts with events and then manufactures meaning. But isn't that what all of us are all doing anyway in our lives? I mean, all this terrible stuff has happened to all of you. I mean, everybody out there. And, and the most privileged person in here, the person with the creme de la mer skin and the, you know, <laughs> kids at Harvard and the Maserati in the parking lot, has suffered the torments of the damned. <laughs> just going about being a human unit, I think. Just going about, you have to, you know, people die, they get sick, you give birth to these angry children, <laughs> you know, to whom you sleep you are essentially slaves um, and, and if you if you grew up like I did in a family where people lied to you I, I, I grew up in a hard drinking family so I was lied to you know with conviction and often um, starting with the phrase I'm not drunk <laughs> always a lie <laughs> Anytime anybody tells you they're not drunk, they're completely gunshed out of their brain. <laughs> um, so, so that literally made me crazy. And one of the things I do as a memoirist is I send my pages out to my friends and family before I, all of my books. It, it, I've used the same process. I notify people in advance. I say, I'm going to write about this time in our lives. You know, squawk now if you can't stand it. Nobody ever has. Um, and then I send pages out to anybody still alive and ask them to vet them or, or correct them. Now the strange thing for me is that that hasn't happened. Other than a minor anecdote or a, um, in a couple of dates, uh, people, I, I I don't know why that is. I don't think my memory is, I think I have a better than average mem memory, but I don't think, I think it's partly the generosity of my friends and family, but I also think that, that memoirs should write very psychologically. You never lose sight of the fact that this is their memory. They never stop showing you their inner, their interiors. So you see their minds feeling around the edges of their experience. For the truth. You never lose sight of this, that this is a subjective reportage. It's, it's an act of memory, not an act of history. And memory is invariably, uh, invariably flawed. Um, so perhaps the key element of writing a great memoir is voice. And if you look in a, you know, if you look in a writing textbook about voice, they'll say, well, that's that just means diction, which is what kind of words you use. And that's literally, it's either copulate or fuck. <laughs> <laughs> most of us are, should deal mostly with monosyllabic words, unless you're like a classics professor or something, and you have one of those black belt vocabularies. Um, and syntax, how the sentences are made, and tone, which is just your emotional relationship with the material. Um, but forget about all of that. None of that is useful when you're writing a memoir. The memoir has to sound like you. The memoirists I've met in my life, 
the Brothers Wolf, Jeffrey and Tobias Wolf, or Cheryl Strait, or Maxine Hong Kingston, or Maya Angelou, or people like that. It's Frank Conroy, Michael Hare. If you meet them, it's sort of like they sound exactly like their books sound. And, and, and if, the, if the page is a mask, it's like you rip the mask off, and their features are exactly molded to the mask's shape. Um, so I think I think you never a better memoirist is constantly kind of reminding the reader this is my experience. This is it's not that this that my recounting is not corrupt. It it kind of admits its corruption because it admits that it comes out of memory. Um, I could go on and on like this, but I just don't want to. <laughs> so why don't you ask me questions if you have any? Thank you. Yes, sir. So, Mr. Weiner. Um, so in the memoirs, um, three really successful books telling the story of your life. Do you now, as you live, look at yourself and look at material as you're living it, or can you detach yourself from that? Did everyone hear that? Do, no. I, just, no. do I just look at my life as material as I'm living it? I've written these three books. Well, the interesting thing is that I looked at it like that when I was 10. Um, I actually don't. You know how when you have a fight or something in your family and you come down the next morning and everybody just acts like it's normal? Okay, well, it's like I wrote these books. And I don't remember what's in them <laughs> because I don't think about them or look at them ever. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like I don't remember that I've written these books. It's, it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And when I start a new book, I always start from negative 100. I, I don't start knowing anything. I'm always feeling my way. So I wish I did. I would be more efficient. Yes, sir. That's you. <laughs> Uh, I'm working on a spiritual memoir, and I'm wondering what would be your first suggestion for, for, for how to go about doing it? A spiritual memoir? Uh, for my, my spiritual journey. Um, I, I think Thomas Martin's Seven Story Mountain is as good a spiritual memoir as I know. Um, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has a good book, I think. Um, I like... I mean, I'm Catholic, so I'm very Catholic heavy on my recommendations. Uh, so St. Teresa of, of Avila's Interior Castle, I think, is a great book. Simone Bay, uh, uh, Waiting for God or Gravity and Grace. Um, uh, the Merton is, I think, particularly good. There's an interesting book called uh, Edward Beck who's a priest. I saw him on TV today talking about the Pope. Um, those are his real, that's his real eye color. Everybody, it looks like he has on those blue contacts. But that's really what his eye, the color his eyes are. He has a great book, and I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called God Underneath. Um, yeah, I saw that in your, your book, in Art of Memoir. Yeah, just a recommendation. Good for me. See, I can have <laughs> one. <laughs> You're not already what's you in there. You just ordered it, actually. So <laughs> But here, I know that when I wrote about spirituality and lit, my last book, I, yeah. it w I was tormented by it. I was somebody who was an atheist my whole life, and then I wasn't even brought up. My parents were Catholic. They were atheists. My father was an old labor organizer who thought it was like a, a trick on poor people. And uh, my mother was this kind of pre-hippie hippie, hippie uh, you know, who thought it was a bunch of horse dookie. So, um... Yeah, I became Catholic. I mean, who knew? I mean, I had a better chance of becoming a drug mule or a pole dancer. But in, 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 in any event, I, I didn't. I, that, those would have been those would have been more lucrative than me. Um, but but anyway, um, there was a point to all that. Oh. Yeah, writing about spirituality to a secular audience is like doing card tricks on the radio. <laughs> so one suggestion I would make to you that I learned only after I'd broken the delete key off my keyboard is don't be afraid, don't write about it from the point of view of faith, write about it from the point of view of doubt. Ah, okay. 
because I spent most of my life not believing in God. So um, I kept writing, and I sounded like this proselytizing. I mean, Catholics don't even proselytize, you know. And I sounded like I was, and I, mean, I didn't feel that way. And then I, I sort of realized I wasn't remembering how I really felt before I believed. Thank you. Yes, sir. Do most people write a memoir for themselves, their family, or for broader audience? And what's the difference in the approach? Uh, that's a great question. I think the memoirist I know who I consider great memoirist, um, that some, you know, the Bakoff say, or I think usually write from deeply personal uh, psychological reasons. Uh, that said, even though writing memoir is cathartic, if the catharsis is only for you, you know, don't publish it. I, I think it's, to me, it's like a little bomb that unless somebody else reads it, it never goes off. It just it's ticking inside its cover. So um, I always have in my mind, um, usually somebody I'm writing about and somebody I really admire. So usually the people I'm writing about, I think, would they say this is true? Is this true? Would they, this sound true to them? And I'm somebody who scratches and scratches and worries and worries. Um, so I would think it's better if you think of an audience. So I'm always kind of morally tormented when I'm working on one of these because I just don't know if I'm getting it right. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this book is so good, so you guys should buy it's it. It's really good, she said. <laughs> I'm gonna buy it. <laughs> this is my plan. We're dating, actually. <laughs> um, someone nice that I think it was honest said of you that you can't write a boring sentence, and I think it's really. Oh, good. I can write a boring sentence. Okay, but you haven't published them, so. <laughs> I throw I threw away 1,200 pages in my last memoir. Yeah. I throw a long one. Okay, well, I'm curious, when you're writing memoir that's so close to you, how do you figure out when you're being boring or not before you get to the point of showing it to other people? How do you figure out when you're being boring or not? Um, it's pretty easy if you read a lot. Like, I think I use an example in the book of writing about my mother taking me to college. I say something like, um, my mother drove me from Texas to Minnesota in our yellow station wagon. You know, period. Eh. I mean, what about that sentence sounds like me? Or, or is vivid or really evocative or alive? And I think the sentence that wound up in the book was something like, I mean, I, I, I don't remember. So, but it's something like, you know, my mother's yellow station wagon move like a monopoly icon between fields of Iowa corn that were chlorophyll grain past, you know, cinnamon rusted tractors, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I was, I was biting my nails raw because I knew I didn't deserve to get into the college I got into. Better. <laughs> Bad. Better. <laughs> so, I mean, the other thing about the Napoli icon as an image is it announces to the reader that I'm in the realm of imagination. I did not view this that way, that I'm viewing it from my adult self's point of view. In some way, I'm kind of projecting this memory. So, in a way, I'm also announcing to the reader this is a remembered experience. This is sort of how I envision it in my mind now as a, you know, 50-something mm -hmm. woman. So that's how I do I just, I, I mostly write boring sentences, so trust me. Yes, sir. <laughs> you. Yes. Uh, do you believe that memoir writing profits or not from psychotherapy? I think, I think, <laughs> does memoir writing profit or not? Sis, that I assume you're a psychotherapist, you've got to be. I love this. <laughs> Cards and the <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I could never have written The Liars Club without, I think I had uh, 14 years of psychotherapy before I started writing it, and I could never have written any of these books without therapy. And that's, now that's not true for Tobias Wolf who wrote This Boy's Life. Um, 
But I know Katherine Harrison, who wrote her book, The Kiss, about her incestuous affair with her father, say. People think ill of her. I just want to say, that woman, I, I have the utmost respect for her. She wrote, she wrote that story twice in novels. And you could just tell this is an artist, like, obsessed with this subject matter. Like, she couldn't, you know, it's the way any of us are when we're tormented by our past. She couldn't purge herself of it. And she also had a sense, I know because she's a friend of mine and she told me, that she had made herself more innocent in fiction. That the daughter is, she made her 14, Catherine was like 19 or 20, I think, when it, she met her father for the first time. And she felt more culpable. And she was in analysis for 10 years before she could undertake that book in nonfiction. And you know, people who think she exaggerated or made up, I mean, she would no more, uh, you know, have made stuff up. It would have killed her. You know, it would have killed her. So most of the memoirs I know do write out of some wound or some troubled place in their past. And the reason I say the good ones are driven to tell the truth is it's sort of, what's the point? You know, what's the point of writing this stuff out if you're not, and I, in my experience, I always get things wrong. My memory, I write at the beginning of Cherry, and I think I actually put this in the book. I remember saying goodbye to my father. And my, I adored my daddy. I was a daddy's girl. He was a half Indian oil worker. He was 45 when I was born. And he took me to every pool hall and bar room and juke joint, <laughs> you know, dice games, and I could shoot pool and, you know, got squirrels into all kinds of interesting <laughs> things. And when I say goodbye to him, it was so devastating. And I, the story I told myself and every therapist I had had for 20 some odd years was that my daddy had sort of abandoned me and uh, emotionally. And in some ways he did, he was an alcoholic. But when I started writing that book and I, I searched my mind for evidence, you know, dramatic evidence. Where were the times that I called him or I asked for him or I reached out to him and he was not there? There were zero. I left him. I was the one who left him. And so as soon as I start writing this, I realize, oh my God, I've been telling myself this lie because of this guilt I felt about leaving him there to drink himself to death, which is exactly what he did. So, um, you know, in my experience, the truth, as you know, as a psychotherapist, is very hard won. It doesn't come on the first draft. It's not, it's not that you're making things up, but you, you just have this idea about yourself, mm -hmm. you know, that you want to believe. So, so everybody get this guy's card. Yes, <laughs> I think my question goes to what you just said, because I was going to ask you how you do navigate past creating false selves and, as a writer. And I'm wondering, How do you navigate past false selves? As a writer. So, like, when you had that realization, you know, or, or other people, when they, you know, you have to, I mean, you have to be able to be objective enough, or is there a feeling that this isn't true? How do you There's a feeling for me of wrongness. I don't even know how to explain it. Uh, I'm good friends with George Saunders. I don't know if y'all have read his 10th of December, but the best book is short stories, you know, in a long maybe since Lori Moore's, you know, first, but great, great writer. And I was talking about the sense of shame, the sense of shame that you have, and, and, and uh, I was talking about it right here, and it's almost like that I was writing Cherry and I was trying to write about early erotic experiences as a little girl. It felt so porno and wrong. And I realized I was superimposing a 40-year-old woman's libido onto this little girl. I wasn't, and what I really thought about, what really had erotic association with me, was not any, you know, being boffed into guacamole or whatever. You know, it, 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 it was more like I wanted the boy I had a crush on to skate over to me at the skating rink and bring me one red rose. And trying to write that with erotic association is pretty 
hard. Um, so I mean, yeah, I think I think we remember through this filter of self, and we bring our false selves to that. And and uh, so I'm always looking. And I'm also, I, when you do this, I mean, when you, anybody ever go to like a high school or college reunion and you, you get there and you're like, who are these old people? <laughs> <laughs> I went to school with all these fresh faces and I always think I don't remember anybody, I don't, I don't know anything that happened. And I remember this girl coming up to me and saying, I'm, I'm Jana White, and me going, I, I'm sorry I can't place you. And she said, I sat across from you in Miss Pickett's English class and the minute she said that. The whole room just like bloomed up around me and I could see her 13 year old face. I could see what her hair was like. I remembered her braces. She played the clarinet. Her dad was a dentist. You know, and I remembered that class and I remember Miss Pickett saying, The principal is your pal, so that you can remember how to spell principal. And, and I remembered where my locker was when I walked out of that class and then I went to speech class and it was to the right and I went to to this other class and then at the and then I walked across the field for the boy I had a crush on was playing football. And all of this stuff just went boom boom, you know, it's like clowns coming out of the car. <laughs> and we all have that experience of just being waylaid by memory. And if I if I don't have memories of that ca physical caliber, it's um it's very hard to write much, you know. It's very and but I like everybody, I keep those kind of packed away in these tidy little sound bites. And uh, the sound bites that we you know are the kind of bullshit we tell ourselves, right? Yes, sir. It seems that women memoirists go on for pages about their feelings and reflections. Women and memoirists go, oh, what about Carl Mausgaard? My strong <laughs> 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 volume. Volumes, does he have that? Just a minute, sir. <laughs> touch the nerve. I just want to say, does anybody ever read the Mausgaard? The first one was so great, and then it's like diluted, right? How many volumes does he have? Four? Yeah. Seven. 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 Yeah, Can you imagine a woman writing about child rearing to that level of detail? They'd kill her. They'd, she'd be dragged behind cars. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> I mean all this in a loving Christian. <laughs> how, what advice would you have for men on how to tap into those feelings which readers seem to want? <laughs> I think, I think, I think men's, let me say that when I was first writing memoirs, there weren't any, there weren't many women's memoirs. There really weren't. There, there was Mary McCarthy, there was Maya Angelou, and like, Helen Keller. And the guys who were writing memoirs were kicking ass. You know, Richard Wright's Black Boy, Tobias and Jeffrey Wool, Frank Conroy. Um, so, I think N you know, Nabokov has the coldest voice of, of anybody. I mean, when you actually read him, you realize this guy's a despicable human being. <laughs> like, you know, I would give him, I would do all kinds of sexual favors for him just based on his ability to write. <laughs> Were he alive? <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is not somebody you would want to have even have a cup of coffee. This is a nasty human being. I mean, made his wife lick his envelopes for him because he didn't. It's too, you know, nasty to have to do that. So um, I think you have to embrace what you bring. I, 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 I think you have to embrace your experience, whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? Even if it's. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> your guyness and your guyosity will, will read better on the page than if you try to do this more touchy-feely, hippy, now scarred, nauseating thing. So, so I think you've got more going for you than you know. I think you just got to trust your own interior, I think. Charlie Baxter. Charlie Baxter, is that Wendy? Yeah. Oh my God, Wendy went to college with her. Uh, you look just like you too. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm astonished. Oh my God. I miss yeah. Wendy. But Charlie Baxter went to college with us too. And there are all of these men, particularly the ones who came out of the Vietnam War, 
who just started writing because they were so broken. I mean, right. Like Michael Pierce dispatches. And they just went. You know? right. So it's there. Just look for it. That's right. I think there are a lot of great men. I would read those good guy books. Yes, sir. Could you talk about your work with Rodney Crowell? Rodney Crowell. How good is old Rodney? Well, let me tell you something. Let me tell you. Okay, this is how I became a, a songwriter. Okay. It's so stupid. <laughs> Rodney and I got have wrote a song where he used the words Mary Carr. And my sister's secretary kept calling me and saying, there's this song on the radio in Houston. And it says, Mary Carr. I said, no, they're saying America. And it sounds like <laughs> So Rodney sends me this this uh, CD of his, and he is in fact singing Mary Carr. And I thought, even the guy who got my name tattooed on his arm didn't put my last name. And let's face it, it's just me. It could be anybody. But so so he wanted me to write songs with him, and I said, it, this will never happen. I will not humiliate myself in a form that I don't know anything about. Well, ten years later, I'm talking to him on the phone about the guys I've dated in my life, and I said. You know, I always say, if the law don't want you, neither do I. And he said, that is a great, like, that's a great hook for a country song. If the law don't want you, neither do I. Right? It's good. It's perfect. I said, you know what? You're right. You know, why don't you write that? I give it to you as a gift. Three days later, Rodney's in my New York City apartment with his Gibson on his name. We're, we're writing this song that Nora Jones sings on this record. And then the second song I work on with Rodney, which I met him in, I was at Berkeley and he was in San Francisco. Uh, God, I'm missing you. Uh, Lucinda Williams sang. Was that the Frank Stallman show? Yeah, that was. Yeah, yeah. So it was so much fun. Being a poet, you sit around in your pajamas all day. You know, being a memoirist, you sob and cry. It's, it's not happy. It's not good. Being a musician, women are throwing yin yang at you and you're just in a truck with all these people and they're singing you know and it's it's so fun it's just wicked it's wicked fun it's solid fun we're actually working on a on another record right now i just saw him yes ma'am um you i said that the voice has to sound just like you if the page is a mask the writer's features are molded to the mask shape. Could you please explain what you mean by that about the features and the mask shape? Um, well, people who've read my book say that when I talk, I sound like myself. Yeah. <laughs> Not like what they thought I would sound like. I don't sound like, say, Emily Dickinson. I mean, she has a very particular, I'm nobody, who are you? You know, I don't have a lot of modesty. I don't use a lot of big words. Um, so the voice is, when I was working on Liars Club, I spent umpteen years in psychotherapy. I spent three or four years trying it as a novel. And then when I decided to write a memoir, I spent nine months just working on the first chapter. All of that was trying to make a voice that sounded like me on the page like I did in my being alive self, like the most interesting version of me, obviously. Yeah, I get that part. It's the mask part that I find confusing that how, how, how does it happen that somebody's features become the shape of the mask if they're not writing it? Well, it's really voice. sort of the opposite, actually. The mask becomes the shape of the features. Yeah. It's a metaphor. It's like, you mean it feels false? <laughs> <laughs> you mean it feels false? It doesn't ring um, true? No, it's not false. I, I, it's not false. You're the right. mask would look like you. Yeah. It would look like you actually. There's a young woman in the white t-shirt. Yes, ma'am. You talked about feeling lonely in, in your childhood years. Feeling lonely, yes. And now as a, as a professional adult writer, what you, which can be very isolating. So it is very like, isolating and sad. What do I do to sustain a community for myself? You know, I do a lot of, I try to do a little volunteer work. You know, I try, I find that if I, um, Kind of the best thing about being Catholic, the really good thing, maybe the some would say the only good thing, is that there is a tradition of working with the poor. And I find doing that is a very uh, sustaining, uh, spiritually, psychologically sustaining thing because I'm looking for people to love kind of all the time. I think, I think, I think in my 20s I thought if I found somebody to love me that I would be okay. And now it's more like I look for people to love. 
you know what I mean? So I go to Pilates classes. I love the ladies in my Pilates class. Um, I have a guy, a gentleman caller type person I've been with now for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> but we spend a lot of time together. I have a great kid who's like all grown up, and um, he and his fiance come to my house because I have I offer free food. <laughs> so, so basically, I feel pretty. And strangely, I don't have a lot of writer friends. I mean, you know, Delillo lives like about 20 blocks from me. I get to see him you know, every now and then for a walk in the park. Um, but most of my friends do something else. Yes, ma'am, in the back, the blonde lady. Um, hi. How do you, how does a writer, a memoirist, reconcile the desire to tell your story and with that of, you know, the desire of family, friends? How do you, how do you re reconcile the desire to tell your story? Oh, like when they say that none of this happened? <laughs> Well, I spent a lot of time, part of what I did in therapy was that I cudgeled my mother <laughs> into talking to me about her trying to kill me with a butcher knife. And um, believe me, that they were not receptive to these conversations, <laughs> neither her nor my sister. Uh, my father was actually pretty good about it because he never tried to kill me with a butcher knife. But um, uh, they were, they were, you know, my mother would threaten to kill herself. My sister would stop speaking to me for a year. Um, they weren't receptive to these conversations, and I literally felt like it was sort of a life or death thing for me to to say, to talk about it, and to hear what they thought had happened. But I did find that what they thought had happened often changed over time, and was that their truths were as malleable as mine. So if someone's truth opposes my truth, I feel obligated to mention it, but not to represent it in full. So, you know, my sister, if, if my sister wrote my books, I would only appear peeing my pants or like biting somebody or you know being unseemly and stuff, being arrested which only happened once but it was vivid in her mind so so um you know I feel obligated to mention what she might say but I don't feel obligated to represent as fully as I would my own truth let them write their own damn books <laughs> yeah yeah if they, you know that said I did I really did give a big rat's ass what they thought, and I was astonished. You would be astonished, the people whose families never change anything. None of the big memoirists I know, none of them. They've all sent pages, Cheryl Stray, you know, sent pages to people. Nobody changed anything. So that's very odd. It is odd. So you'd be surprised, maybe, hopefully. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was thinking about the book A Million Little Pieces. And a Million he, Little Pieces, uh, James Brown. Uproar when there were a few things that were not factual. And I'm just wondering about when you're talking about you were going to write it as a novel but decided to write it as a memoir. Right. That line between. There's not a big line. <laughs> the only people who say there's a big line are the people who get busted for lying. <laughs> so the people who have dominated the airwaves and talking about memoir are the big fat liars. The people who get endless hours on Oprah or Larry King or CNN or whatever. It's James Fry. I've never been on any, any of those shows. Um, if you're making stuff up to appear a different way to your reader, that's not okay. It's not okay to make stuff up unless you do what say Pam Houston does where she says 82% of this is true. So so that so you can set the line wherever you want to set it, but it, what I recommend to my students, if you permit yourself to make stuff up, it's almost like you don't do honor to your own experience. It's like you don't respect your own like the thing I always thought about James Brown, he must have suffered plenty. He didn't have to rooster around and like give himself a bullet hole in his cheek and then biting off cops but you know by himself 
and going to jail for these long jail terms and you know fake suicidal girlfriend. He, he didn't have to do all that. I'm sure he had plenty of suffering to render. And it's almost like he didn't trust his own experience. So if believe me, if I could make stuff up, I would behave a lot better in all my memoirs. <laughs> so, so I just read the way I the way I put it in the book, you know, when somebody says, I think it was Vivian Gornick who says, you know, we'll just make it up and see if it's true. I just, <laughs> I just make it up. There's nothing wrong with that, but if you tell me after the fact it's sort of like the deli guy saying after you've had a sandwich, I put just a teaspoon of cat shit in your sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that makes it a cat shit sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the positives of taking writing classes. So versus coming into writing uh, from a storyteller's point of view and not having had writing classes or you've read. Why do you think writing classes are good? Well, the, the, I'm asking you whether, because you obviously teach writing and there's uh, there are obviously advantages to taking writing, otherwise people wouldn't take the writing class. You know, I, I, think, I think taking, I mean, I was an idiot. Uh, there's no better, no kinder way to put it. You know, I got to graduate school, I was 23 years old. I've been living in Europe. I moved to England to stop drinking. That's funny. <laughs> um, imagine my surprise um, when I drank more. Uh, and everybody approved of it. So, um, and I got to graduate school. I had these amazing teachers. Robert Haas, you know, who teaches at Berkeley. He's one of my teachers. Heather McHugh. Um, Louise Gluck was my thesis advisor, great American poet. Um, Ellen Bryant Boyd, you know, all these great writers. I met Charlie Simic and Jeffrey and Tobias Wolf and Frank Conroy and all these great writers when I was 23 years old. They gave me a reading list and I did everything they told me to do. Like when my students argue with me, I'm like, I don't understand this, you know. You're paying money for me to tell you what to do. If, if you know what to do, stay home, you know. Um, <laughs> I was, I really benefit, and I, I benefited from workshops and from, you know, giving my pages to people. I mean, I was in this workshop at Harvard when I wrote the, the Liars Club as a novel. It was so bad. It was so bad. How bad was it? Um, <laughs> it was Johnny Carson bad. I don't know. No, it was, Sven Burkertz was in that group, uh, a novelist, Greek novelist named Stratus Javiers. Seamus Heaney came a couple of times. Um, Robert Polito, poet and, and now nonfiction writer. I remember them saying, don't, uh, don't write this as fiction. You know, your nonfiction is better than your fiction. And if just one person had told me that, I might not listen, but having like seven people tell me that, it's like, okay, I get it. You know, I'm, I'm mistaken. I'm, the nature of my talent is not in fiction. My psyche is going to use that as an excuse to lie. Mm -hmm. So for me, just the nature of my ability, the way I could tell the story best, was in nonfiction. They saved me years. I would have just re kept writing the novel. So I think that's, I wouldn't teach unless I thought it were valuable to my students. Yes, ma'am. Um, I find that if I hear, if I read my own work out loud, or I hear other people read their work out loud, I can hear where I'm still like lying to myself, where it's still mine. Right. If you are. read it out loud, you can feel yourself. You're you're exactly right, right? Yeah. You can just feel it's like a discomfort, or you get itchy, and you think, well, this this just isn't right yet. It's not that you're making up things that didn't happen. It's just that there's something shallow or canted wrong in your interpretation of something, right? So, do you read out loud? Do you read? I, no, I don't. <laughs> but maybe I should start. It sounds like a great idea. I read my poems out loud, but I've never read my prose out loud. so long. So. Yes, ma'am. How do you go about guiding your students into a real effective use of metaphor, which you do so brilliantly? How do you get them? How do I get them to use metaphor so well? Well, it's, it really depends on, on the nature of each, each person's talent. There are people who just aren't going to be good at using metaphor. They're going to be good at 
something else. Maybe they have a great philosophical mind, you know, like Nabokov has a great philosophical mind. Um, but he's also actually better at metaphor than anybody. But, but I try to get each student to sort of find what it is that they can do better than other people. That's why I was saying to you that there's something about being a man that uh, I think would make your whatever you're writing better than if you try to infuse it with this other thing. So, um, you know, if you, there are a lot of, there are a lot of great poems, obviously. Um, if you read Michael Hare's Dispatches, which I think is arguably the best book about war I've ever read, um, I, I'm not the only person who holds that opinion. Uh, his use of metaphor is extraordinary. There's also a young woman named Ella uh, uh, Batchuman or Batchuman, um, who wrote a great book called uh, Possessed Adventures with Russian Novels and the People Who Read Them. Sounds kind of boring. Raj Chaz did the cover for it. Here's an example that, of like one chapter begins. The collective works of a Russian writer are not something you can just put in your suitcase and run away with. Um, The collected Tolstoy, which just released, fills a hundred volumes and weighs as much as a, as a newborn beluga whale. <laughs> I know because I weighed it. I took my, she took her scale to the library and weighed it ten volumes at a time. <laughs> I read that essay in a, in a magazine. She was friends of one of my students called N plus one. Initially the metaphor was, weighs as much as a large timber wolf. Wolf, Russian, but beluga whale, why is that better? Because it's, it's a mammal, but it doesn't seem like a mammal. It occupies this other element, and it has the associations with caviar, and, and all of it. You know, it's this rare, exotic thing. It's so much better as a metaphor. So if you read Bituman, or actually the fiction writer Isaac Babel, who, who Bachuma writes about. He's a brilliant user of, of metaphor. Read his red cavalry, uh, cavalry stories. Really amazing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you describe a little bit how faith influenced your memoir writing? Like um, Christian Wyman talks about how his faith changed the quality of his poetry, or it really shifted how he wrote poetry. I'm curious how faith affected your storytelling in a way of well, I honestly think until I started praying, uh, I didn't publish much. <laughs> I, mean, I know, isn't that funny? So everybody go home and ask baby Jesus. No, <laughs> no I, I started, uh, when I got sober like 26 years ago, I started praying, a, I started a meditation practice that was essentially a centering secular, I didn't believe in anything, a secular practice of, just counting my breaths one to ten over and over. And then I started praying based on, on uh, my spiritual director's advice for what to write. And I found that there was, uh, when I got really stuck on my last book, that there's this voice up here that's always afraid. And it's always wants to know where I am in line and how many books I've sold and if I'm going to be invited to this or that. or you know, how I look naked. <laughs> and, and, the, and there's another voice that's kind of south of my neck. And if you don't believe in God, call it your sane self or your true self or whatever. But it's almost literally, physically, like I, I feel like I'm writing out of a different part of my body. I know that sounds insane, but I'm going to say it anyway. But, so I just found in prayer that when I'm up here, and I could be up here for six weeks, just throwing away pages over my shoulder as I generate them, um, that prayer helps me to, to get less afraid. I, I had a Jesuit priest tell me when I was stuck on my last book, what would you write if you weren't afraid? And when I'm really stuck, that's what I ask myself, and I never know the answer. I never know the answer, and so it's only kind of through prayer and throwing a lot of stuff away that I think I get to that. Yes, sir. 
or ma'am, I'm sorry. <laughs> The difficulty of expressing the ineffable. I can say a Rumi poem for you. How about that? Rumi does better. Okay, here's this poem. It's called, uh, what is it called? I'll remember the title after I say it. It's a translation is Robert Bly, so it's probably inaccurate, but it begins. Uh, <laughs> I talk to my inner lover and say, why such rush? We sense there is some spirit that loves birds and animals and the ants. Perhaps it's the same spirit that gave a radiance to you in your mother's womb. Is it logical you'd be walking around entirely orphaned now? The truth is, you turned away yourself and chose to go into the dark alone. Now you're tangled up in others, and you have forgotten what you once knew. And that is why everything you do has some weird failure in it. The poem's called The Radiance, I just remembered. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah do that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. How much of a role and what kind of a role does your editor play in your memoirs? My editor, um, my editors have played, I've had two, and they've, well, I've had a lot of editors over the years, uh, editors for essays, poems, memoirs. I, I'm somebody who takes a lot of edits. I don't usually argue with an editor. Um, in this book, there were two edits that I got from my two most trusted people in my kitchen cabinet, as I call them. My editor, Jennifer Barth at HarperCollins, and my agent, who's a big deal, fancy agent. And they both said for me to cut out everything where I'm talking about my own writing practice. And I said, people want to know that. And if I don't put it in, I'm kind of like not telling them my own experience. So I, I knew I didn't want it to be the focus of the book, but I, so I put it, and I put little disclaimers at the beginning of those chapters saying, if you want to hear me talk about myself anymore, just pull balls <laughs> over this. So, so I, that's, but mostly I do what they, mostly I do what they tell me. Yes, ma'am. I remember when you, I think initially came to Syracuse, I lived there for 40 years before I moved here. Um, and you wrote an essay about trying to find a spiritual home. This was apparently... Oh, yeah, I wrote an essay about... And you took your kid around. I took my kid around. I wrote an essay. It was in Vogue magazine, or so I say vague, um, <laughs> which I only buy for the articles. <laughs> my son came to me one day and said, why? I want to go to church. And I said, why? And he said, to see if God's there. It was like the only thing he could have said to get me to go to church. That's, this is how I wound up Catholic. And we did this thing called Gaurama. For every weekend, we would go to like a Buddhist Zendo or a, you know, Jewish temple. I'm sure you went temple. to my synagogue, and I had to oh What synagogue? I went to we Temple not, Concord. We were not friendly enough. I'm no, no, but I also, <laughs> I went to a kind of commentary that, uh, no, no, everybody was totally friendly. Are you kidding? A chick sound like me wanders in? Um, no, everybody was, it was a Temple Concord? Oh, no, everybody was super nice there. They were very nice. I wasn't president, but um, they were very nice. Um, and we wound up in, in St. Andrew's Church with uh, Joe Kane. And, um, and Jerry Berrigan is, oh, uh, was going to, I know, I just saw his yeah. widow, so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he goes to my church in Syracuse now, or he did, before he went to live with Jesus. <laughs> uh, maybe two more questions? Yes, ma'am? Have you read Seven Basic Plots by, I think his name is Booker? It sort of talks about plots, seven plots, like the quest, rebirth, Voyage and Return. There's like seven of them. Right, like seven basic plots. Yeah, and sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I was I was going to ask if you if you well, lit for example is a rebirth story. If you want to look at it from that point of view, um, it is, but it's also structured in a way like 
uh, Moby Dick, and, uh, which all my books are in, that it starts with a flash forward, sort of shows what's emotionally at risk for the writer, and then goes back, you know, sitting on the coffin telling the tale. It's a very old school. And then I move in linear fashion toward, toward that conclusion. It's a, it's a very common. Somebody else said there were only two plots. One of them was, you know, you know, two people start on a journey or a stranger comes to town. <laughs> you know? So maybe one last question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, it seems like you have a lot of background. I'm envied, but you're just like you and me. Um, what can you give hope to somebody who doesn't have an education in literature? I don't have an education in literature. I would, I, I never picked up my high school diploma. It's kind of dubious whether I ever got one. I think I didn't. Okay. Um, I never got a college degree. I weaseled my way into graduate school. Wow. So I'm mostly pretty self-taught. I'm mostly, uh, but those two years, you know, I mean, if you want to write memoir, the list of memoirs in the back of the book. Yeah. I, I'm not just selling books, but I mean, the ones that are asterisk are ones that I've taught, and they're all pretty great. I mean, if I've, if I've taught them, they're all pretty, they're things that have, to me, held up over time. So anyway, thank you guys for coming. Thank you.